What? No, I, I, I'm, I'm the babysitter. What? He's not a real babysitter. He's a do whatever I say or I'll kill you type of babysitter. What? No, nope. that sounds That's way. What said. Boy, shut the fuck up. I'm the heckin' best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome back, you awesome little video creeps, you. Before we begin, just make sure to go ahead and hit that like button, subscribe, maybe even drop a little comment, even if it's just to say hello. All that stuff helps me out, so you know, help. With the arrival of Psycho Goreman hitting Shudder on the 20th, it felt nothing but right to go ahead and take that dive. So we're gonna go over that awesome and absurd ride that we all know and love as Psycho Goreman. Or at least that some, some of us love. I, I don't know about those people, but the Power Ranger lover inside of me, like that kid, he's screaming right now. And just a reminder that this film will be spoiled for you, just in case you haven't gotten around to seeing it. Which, why Why would you do that to yourself, though? So if you haven't, go ahead and go on Shutter, or just go ahead and buy it, because we're going to get into this thing right now. Remember, watch the whole video. Don't be a bitch. Psycho Gorman is a Canadian sci-fi comedy horror film written by Stephen Kostansky, who made films like Manborg and fucking Leprechaun Returns. Both films that I enjoy quite a bit, so the, like, yeah, it just makes sense that I like this one. He went into this film describing it as a way to make Harry meets the Hendersons versus like Guar, which is metal as a pipe, y'all. Now, originally, the film was set to premiere at the SSSW Film Festival. However, due to the current pandemic and state of all the shit, the event was canceled, leaving the film in limbo. That is until RLJE came right in with Shudder, giving it distribution and a place for streaming opportunities. A couple titles that you may recognize from RLJE, 2020's Castle Freak, Spree, Color Out of Space, Satanic Panic, Mandy, Puppet Master, The Littlest Reich, and many, many more cool films. And of course, if you're already a horror fan, you know what Shudder is. For those of you who don't know, it is a all horror, all the time streaming service like Netflix or Hulu, but it's just for us. And if you're a horror fan and you don't have it, you're, you're, you're fucking up, cause it's cheap and it kicks ass. I'm currently watching In Search of Darkness 2 on there. The movie so far has also won multiple awards as well, taking it at the Sheffield Horror Film Festival, Monster Fest, and the Philadelphia Film Festival. However, with a budget of $670,000, since its release in January, it's only made back about $95,000. We're only in May and it just did hit Shudder, so hopefully a lot more people will be exposed to it and they'll get the money and recognition that it deserves. Now, unfortunately, there's not a ton of background that I know about this film that I was able to find beyond a couple cool interviews with Steven himself, but I was able to unearth a couple of very cool facts. One that caught my attention was the fact that the guy who played Psycho Gorman, it actually took him so long to get in that and then he spent so much time in that outfit that when he was like out of it, People didn't recognize him and they would just call the cops on him because some random asshole is on a closed set. Hilarious. Something that you may have not caught unless you're a huge fan of Stevens is that the zombie cop from this movie is actually a nod to an earlier work of his from 2012 called Biocop. A film that I am now incredibly interested in getting my hands on and watching. One last fact that I'll throw your way before we get into the film itself is that the mother of Alistair that we see at the end of the movie is actually the same person that, like, she's fucking Pandora. This is very cool. I love when shit like that happens. Something else that's kind of cool is that I read that the blob was a big inspiration on Alistair himself. Like, just, it was supposed to pay, like, this beautiful homage to B-horror films, like the ones that Steven grew up watching. Though, like, okay, the parallels between, like, 1957's The Brain from Eris, if that's how you fucking say that shit. Yeah, it, it is, it's, no, it's noticeable. But fuck that, The Blob, let's go. All right, all right, no more fucking around. Let's get into the movie. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now we open up with a Star Wars slash Texas Chainsaw Massacre type crawl that tells us all about a time where there was a nameless evil and how it was going around just straight murking shit until the forces of light came in, banishing him to earth. Heavy stuff for a minute in, I know. So let's lighten it up a little bit with two kids at play. A little boy named Luke, who we will be seeing again in Terrifier 2, playing Sean, and a little girl named Mimi, who you may have seen in Books of Blood on Hulu. Just the innocence and carefree exuberance of children, playing a lighthearted game delightfully called Crazy Ball where the victor becomes the master of the universe and the loser gets buried a fucking life. And the game immediately gets real to some serious mighty morphin power, like shredding guitar, it's dope. After a switcheroo goes down in the game, Luke loses and is forced to dig his own grave, good, good insult to injury there. And this is when they come across a really cool glowing like stone. The kids head to bed where they meet mama demeans her husband and clearly stone dad when Mimi puts mom in her fucking place for calling it kooky ball. It's crazy ball. Thanks Mimi, you're my favorite character. Now back in that yard, some goosebumps level tension is building up until things get real adult real quick as we see the silhouette of a monster that just looks like a roided out creature from the lagoon. A tweaker calls him a tweaker. <laughs> cool. And then creature from the lagoon like fucking rips their head off. There's blood everywhere. Just right off those baby bum shoulders. How strong. Then we see this remaining just like straight wreck the last guy who's just pleading for his life. So the calculated monster of torture, he decides, fuck it, yeah, okay, I'll keep you alive forever then. Which fucking wow, what a way to like set the bar for an awesome character like this. The next day we see Mimi and Luke getting praise for the hole that they dug. Though we know that that was not, I mean, they filled it in and then, you know, crazy shit. But it is quite a hole, which if you're a love interest of mine, I will say to you, the kids devise a plan to find whatever creature crawled out of that hole. Luke wants to call the cops, but Mimi fills Luke in on her feelings about Blue Lives Matter and basically says, A cap, motherfucker, we can do this shit ourselves. Handle this internally, in house. Now, later on that night, they are able to go out looking for this creature. Very dangerous indeed. However, like, it, they have flashlights and like some kind of danger ball contraption that Mimi concocted. And this is when they run into like Mr. Has to Stay Alive Forever guy. And oh my God, this fucking, this design. I love this guy. Just the, the eyes rolling backward. It's a super cool aesthetic that you don't see very often in horror films. And I appreciate that it made its way into this. Now this is also when they have to face that huge monstrous killer, which is something that I'll say to you if you're a romantic interest of mine. He goes to kill the children, but this is also when it's revealed that like that stone that Mimi is in possession of and whoever controls it, he can't do shit to, which for Mimi's character is a tits development. Completely understanding that she now basically has a pet evil doer, she decides that it's time to name the guy, dubbing him Psycho Gorman. She orders him to stay put and she fucking splits home. Meanwhile, on a planet far, far away, the news of Psycho Gorman has fucking big, shitty implications. And this is when we meet like the Gygax Council, who are just fucking dope looking. It's a snake looking dude, this fucking incredible looking thing. Again, my Power Rangers nostalgia radar is running amok. Especially after meeting fucking Pandora, she just the dope, like the chief crusader of the council. She's a, clearly a badass. They start talking about Psycho Gorman and how he is evil incarnate. A destroyer of worlds who they must find and just fucking kill. Unlike the first time where they trap him and then send him away so that way he can suffer in like carbonite, some Han Solo shit, which I'm not sure how they came to that solution in the first place. I would be so pissed if this guy came and he blew up my world and they're like, no, he stays alive, but um, he doesn't get to play with his rock anymore. He's destroyed a ton of shit, but solitary confinement, that's the, that's the thing. Fuck that. You put that motherfucker down. Also, Gygax is like a reference to one of the dudes who made fucking, uh, the, what's that, the fucking, 
the Demi Gorgon and Stranger the uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Gary Gygax. Like, and that's cool. I like shit like that. Now Pandora decides to hide her fucking, she doesn't look like a human, so she makes herself look like one. And she heads to Earth in order to find this guy. Meanwhile, the kids introduce Psycho Gorman to their friend Alistair, where Psycho Gorman gets to tell his side of the exact same story that we just heard the council tell. And there definitely is two different sides to every story. He, yeah, he absolutely is evil. But when you hear his side of things, it's kind of like, well, yeah. We learned that he was born into a life of straight servitude, enslaved on Gygax to the Templar. Then one day while shoveling dirt, he comes across a legendary stone. The stone grants him immense powers, and he was finally strong enough to fight against the Templar, stopping at nothing until he became a destroyer of worlds. Now this incredible story bores to shit the kids, and they order him to watch TV, you know, so that way he's not so lame. But using the TV, he's able to communicate to his loyal subjects telling them the location of where he is for them to come and find him. So that way they can rescue him and they can continue to try and destroy the planet and like the whole universe really. And again, another fucking noteworthy effect. It's a small one, but it's cool. Seeing his hand on that with the static and then the blood trickling down, that's dope. This movie just has so much style. Later, we see the kids back at the house where they're all eating dinner together and Alistair is over eating with them. Mimi suggests that they all go outside to play, but Alistair and Luke kind of just want to go play video games. Which, by the way, they're playing like N64 and shit. What I think is the most underused video game console and TV cinema like history. That's such a specific time that we never get to visit like that in movies. I personally appreciate the N64 because it was the first console that I had that I didn't have to share with a sibling or anything. So whenever I see it, it just it serves up these great memories of like Conker's Bad Fur Day and like DK64, Smash Brothers. Like it just, the list goes on and on and on. Turok was my shit too. But Mimi doesn't share my fond memories of the N64. And using her stone, she summons PG to come play with her. But this only leads to very scared parents and Alistair being turned into a brain. Where then all four of them like decide to join a band. Which I'm not gonna lie, is my favorite part of this movie. Watching Mimi sing this awesome song and seeing Psycho Gorman on the fucking drums. Ah, dope. Which Steven actually says was like one of the main ideas that he had for this movie was just like this huge monster sitting at a drum set. That's like one of the early seeds for this movie. I love, that's just cool. This scene, it just gives me so much happiness on the inside. I love it. And that song has been stuck in my head for days. And this is all set to a montage of life now with Psycho Gorman. They're like going thrift store shopping and getting ice cream and shit. Just seeing Mimi having the time of her life, knowing that she's basically invincible now. A serious highlight of the film for me. However, let us not forget that fucking PG is still a bloodthirsty killer, and he ends up infiltrating Luke's nightmares, trying to persuade him to steal the stone from Mimi. But Luke is all fucking finders keepers, bro. Hell no, that's the law. Which it is, fuck out of here. Straight up, if you don't honor pinky swears and finders keepers, I don't trust you. Indian giving too, that shit ain't I. Right. They teach PG how to play crazy ball, but this is when like these two cops show up and that whole blue lives matter thing fucking comes up again, making quick work of the officers and turning one of them into like this fucking creature. Pandora finds her way to earth and shortly after that, so do all of PG's lackeys. He orders them to kill Mimi and take back the stone. However, his lackeys are like, bitch, you bugging. We love you not being a thing that exists. Fuck, fuck that. And they decide just to beat the shit out of Psycho Gorman. Easy fucking peasy. Basically laughable for PG. Because without even thinking about it, he can just like rip these guys apart in a second. Except that Mimi's pretty pissed off about that whole you tried to get me fucking murk thing commanding him not to fight back, so they just lay the fuck into him. And he just lays there getting his shit rocked. Eventually, Mimi does force him to apologize to her and allows him to fight back, killing everybody and honoring the last standing traitor with a warrior's death. Which, for those of you not in the know, is when you eat the entire fucking body 
of the person that you're fucking hardcore, man. And it's fucking incredible looking. The huge teeth and the puking blood and the huge blah, blah. It just works in every way for me. It's a great visual gag. And it's a valid plot point that comes back again. But major damage is done to PG. And he's way too wrecked to continue on. Now, before we're done with that little group of fucking like scallywags that were traitors to Psycho, can we just talk about this fucking lackey in particular? I am legitimately kind of spooked out by this thing. I am not a fan of the big body little head. Fuck that. That shit's creepy. But man, is that cool. Now, with Psycho Gorman literally bleeding out Pepto-Bismol, they get Dad to come and pick them up. But when they get back home, Pandora is standing with Mom. Oh, shit! Luke stands with his mother, and they try to convince Mimi that this is enough. This guy is fucking dangerous. It's time to hand over Psycho Gorman so that way we can save the universe. But she looks over at Dad, and together they just fucking drive off. And it's peppered throughout this film how great the father is and how awesome the relationship between him and Mimi is. I mean, it's not healthy at all. But for a fictionalized relationship in this kind of movie, in this kind of setting, why not? I think that's okay. And from this point in the movie on, these two are just thick as thieves. And I really love what the relationship does for both characters. Psycho Gorman tells Mimi that the only way to really save his life is if he becomes one with the stone again. And not knowing what to do, because if he does get the stone back, he will destroy the entire planet. She asks her dad for help. And he gives her terrible advice about a time when he was younger where a man tried to get him to get into a van so that way he could show him a really cool card collection. And he listened, and when he went in the van, there was an awesome card collection. It's just funny and perfect. I enjoy their dynamics so much. But the truth is that that's how I feel about Mimi and everybody in this movie. Pairing up Mimi with anyone is just awesome for me. Make no mistake, the movie's called Psycho Gorman, but this is Mimi's movie. She prays for fashion advice, gets a little blasphemous, and then decides that she's gonna give the stone to Psycho Gorman. But this is when she realizes that the stone has been stolen. Just at that moment, Luke, Mom, who is now also a fucking Megazorg, and Pandora all burst through the doors of this little area where everybody is. It's the exact same place that they found Psycho Gorman. And they go head to head for the most important game of Crazy Ball that has ever happened. Mom, Luke, Pandora, all up against Dad, Mimi, and Psycho Gorman. Obviously, Team Mimi wins, but Pandora does not honor the rules of Crazy Ball and sets out to kill PG anyway, bitch. But after singing a little song that teaches everybody a little bit about love, Luke gives the stone back to Mimi, who puts it into Psycho Gorman, restoring his health and making him max level badass again. Ripping off pieces of Pandora's spine to make a sword and fuck her up, ultimately giving her a warrior's death. The movie ends at dawn, where Psycho Gorman is now officially free with the stone back inside of himself, and he turns around and thanks the family for teaching him about love. And he takes the legendary stone out of his chest and throws it towards Mimi, saying that he doesn't need it anymore, because he has that love inside of his heart. Then he turns around and just starts straight fucking up some small town somewhere. Huge laugh out of me. Gigant. Oh boy, did I love that. Just the timing and the switch from the t it was just perfect. Bringing the movie to a beautiful close, and the movie fucking ends. <laughs> Final this is the ultimate fish out of water story. And it's perfect to tell like a huge horror fan with an Ultraman heart. As far as I'm concerned, this movie really does feed me in every way that's important. It has this great 80s sci-fi touch while somehow feeling new and modern. It's so simple to digest and it leaves you on such a high note. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a Psycho Gorman 2 or 3. I would welcome them if they were able to keep up this exact same momentum. 
So what made me love Psycho Gorman so much? I mean, my feelings on it are deeply personal, honestly. It taps into a place in my heart where I remember this kind of youthful fun whenever watching a movie. It gives me the same feeling that younger me felt when I would watch like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the live action movie, or fucking Mortal Kombat and shit. And the truth is, yes, some of the criticism that I've seen going around for this movie are true underneath a microscope. People say nothing really happens in Psycho Gorman, and when it does, it's far and in between. I would argue that that's kind of the point. Do you think the climax of this film would have been Crazy Ball if they were trying to portray this great war that's been stretching back a fucking millennia? Hell no, that's not what the movie is, and you might just be a little bit butthurt about it. I've heard people say that this movie feels like a sitcom and that the writing is lazy. And I couldn't disagree more. I think this film hits that perfect sweet spot. It's nestled right between that sitcom feeling and like this weird trauma thing. But it sets itself aside with this elegance and style that the film just naturally has. But by and large, the biggest complaint that I've heard about this movie is with the character Mimi. People really seem to hate how self-centered and egotistical she is. People will love the movie but not understand why Mimi had to be that way. So here's my perspective on the character of Mimi. Her character literally had to be written that way, guys. How else was she gonna gain the respect of Psycho Gorman? Period. I mean, look at the lyrics of her song and think about Psycho Gorman's history. You're not my boss, you can't tell me what to do. Mentally, these two needed to be on the same wavelength. And Psycho Gorman is a fucking psycho. Do you think that same level of mutual respect would have gone down if Luke found the stone? If Mimi acted just like Luke, do you think Psycho Gorman would have grown? He saw in Mimi her strength, which is something that he respected. Mimi being the way that she was in this movie is the only way for that character to make sense. And to those people who think Luke was way better than Mimi, I do respect your opinion, but for me, I just fucking, I found Luke to be one of the weakest characters in the movie. But even that is arguable to the balance between Luke and Mimi. Another thing that I really love about this film is how it plays with who the real bad guys are. Again, if you're enslaved your entire life and then you finally get the opportunity to be all powerful, wouldn't you also go like a little ham? I know I would fail that responsibility at first. If I had to give this movie a flaw though, I would say that I'm very curious about that stone. It's even said in the film itself that we don't know the full capabilities of that stone. I would like to learn those things. I know a lot of us were going into this film expecting PG to go ahead and settle the score for all of these kids bullies and shit. But after getting to know these characters, who the fuck is gonna bully Mimi? She herself is such a good bully, she was able to master controlling Psycho Gorman. I've seen the movie three times at this point, and I gotta say, I really fucking enjoy it. There's some serious standout visuals in this thing, like the cubing of the human and the smat and then blood. The creature designs are so unique, and there's so much practical. There is CG in this as well, but the practical, you're not gonna remember the CG. You're definitely gonna remember all the practical effects in this though. I love seeing Brain Alistair and Zombie Cop, the blood chamber fucking dude with all the guts in him, like just really cool, innovative ideas. I personally feel like Psycho Garman is an awesome time and totally worth you picking up and adding to your collection. And if you dug this film too, recommend it to a friend. Cause Steven is totally down to do a sequel if we just give the movie the love that it deserves. Let's not final girls this thing. Now, if you dug this review and maybe even learned something, consider subscribing if you're not already subscribed. Another reminder just to hit the like button. Make sure that you're following me across my social media so that way we can be friends. If you really wanna be a fucking badass and help me out, if you got the $3, become a Patreon. I have so much cool content on there that oh, none of you guys get to see except for them. And of course, I get to sing your name in the Patreon song. That, of course, will play after I say this. Peace, video creeps.
walking through this old house noticing you across the floor thinking how badly my heart would hurt if you weren't here no more rebecca reviews and kiyoko larry sherman and corey stewart car woman and spooky butcher's grindhouse and six iron lola x corin runs with punks Michael Andrews, Mandy Captain, Boots and Gremnir, Survivor's Guild, you guys all killed this being my Patreon shit, so thank you all so much, you make me wanna put my hands across these nipples of mine, yeah these nipples of mine. Maybe it's not okay to jerk off in public places But that's the way that you make me feel when I see your faces Your faces, so oh, Thank you, thank you, thank you That's what I'm saying here it's Thank you, thank you, thank you That's what I wanna say Thank you For being my Patreon, thank you Thank you.